Hello, everyone, and good evening. My name is Taryn Urquhart, and I am the Arts and Special Events Programmer here at the West Vancouver Memorial Library. On behalf of the library and the West Vancouver Art Museum, I would like to welcome you to tonight's talk. While I recognize that we are all in different places this evening, I would like to acknowledge the West Vancouver Library and Art Museum reside within the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Squamish Nation, Tsleil-Waututh Nation, and Musqueam Nation. We recognize and respect them as nations in this territory, as well as their historic connection to the lands and waters around us since time immemorial. I am personally grateful to call the Pacific Northwest my home, and I'm thankful to the Coast Salish communities that continue to protect the natural beauty and animal diversity that surround me every day. It has been my great pleasure to work with Hilary Letwin and her guests tonight to bring this event to your screens. And now I would like to pass things over to Hilary, who's waiting for us over at the museum. Hilary. Thank you very much, Taryn. We are so delighted to be co-presenting this evening's discussion with the library. Welcome to the West Vancouver Art Museum. We're meeting tonight uh, to discuss our new exhibition, A Refuge, Arthur Erickson. This is a co-production with the Arthur Erickson Foundation and many other people who have helped to bring this project to light. I'm joined this evening by my co-curator, Clinton Cuddington. Thank you, Clinton. Thank you. And also by Michael Prokopow, who has contributed to this project as well. Uh, and I will let them introduce themselves. Uh, um, I'm Clinton Cuddington, uh, Principal of Measured Architecture and uh, uh, Director uh, of the, uh, on the Arthur Erickson Foundation. Michael Prokopov, I'm a professor at OCAD University in Toronto, also a member of the Arthur Erickson Foundation. Pleasure to be here. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. So tonight we're talking about this project. It's been a long project in the works. We've, mm -hmm. we've been talking about it, planning for it for a number of, of years now. Uh, so we're gathered to, to really celebrate the centenary of Arthur Erickson, 1924, year of his birth. Uh, and uh, we've, we've had some remarkable um, moments to reflect on with this particular project. So I'd like to just tell our audience a little bit about how this particular project came about. Uh, and we here at the Art Museum, uh, we approached the foundation because we have this collection of very important photography by Selwyn Pullen, which is part of our collection uh, gifted to us by Selwyn Pullen. Uh, and um, the photographs that, that we possess show Arthur's garden from 1965 uh, at his home in Vancouver in Point Grey, and a second set of photographs from 1972 which show Arthur in his house uh, and, uh, and, and details of the house as well. So when we knew that the centenary was approaching, uh, we sat down and started to talk about how we could work with the Arthur Erickson Foundation to put together this particular project. Uh, and um, I'd, I'd love to hear more from your perspective about why this exhibition made sense mm -hmm. for the foundation at this time. Um, I bring a, a very specific lens to uh, the foundation. I was fortunate to have met Arthur. Uh, I knew, studied him. I come to his work tangentially. I, I was under Bing Tom's wing, Arthur's um, mentee for, uh, for a decade. And I was thrilled to be asked to be involved in this precisely because I did not bring a very strong uh, connectivity to Arthur in particular. Um, there are other great individuals who can speak to that. Um, I have largely come to the, the work as a student trying to understand who, uh, who Arthur was and what his lessons were. And to be able to have an event that brings one away from the formal gaze of, of Arthur's public life into the, into the private precinct of his home to see all those catalytic uh, uh, devices uh, gathered throughout his, his travels, the books he read, uh, was fundamental in understanding the totality of who Arthur was, this, uh, uh, this individual uh, who uh, had a need, I'm assuming, from, from, what, I am, uh, from what I am 
learning about the work and the things that he surrounded himself with. He needed to have that reprieve, that ability to restore, to continue to see uh, the divinity in, in, in all things around him. And I was excited that, uh, that this kind of event could sit coupled beside a, a, a greater celebration of Arthur's public life. So I feel that this show brings you right into the intimacy of, of his, his personal domain. The photos that we have are incredibly intimate yes. and, and they're not, they don't show a gleaming pristine interior, they show uh, wallpaper that's peeling and, and paint that's a little bit scuffed and it's, it is a true home yes. that mm-hmm. is lived in. And that's really what inspired our title, A Refuge, because he used his home and his garden as a retreat. Yes. Absolutely. And, and Michael, from your perspective, are, are you on the foundation and sort of here involved in this project with the same perspective, or do you bring a slightly different lens to it? Certainly on the foundation and committed in light of the centenary to having the public who may know Mr. Erickson in certain ways or don't know Mr. Erickson at all, have the opportunity to reacquaint themselves with mm-hmm. a person who was important in the community and in the global scheme of making space. Uh, and for people who don't know, to be made aware that this genius was of this place, and even though working in a very broad international scale, always came back to this house and garden, which is why I think the title of the exhibition is so important, because it was for Mr. Erickson a refuge. And it was a refuge, if I may want make one more comment, that was constantly evolving. Mm. I mean, we can see that by looking at some of the details in the photographs, the furniture's changed, the whatever. And there were many more iterations of the house in his mm-hmm. lifetime. And I think that suggests for me his need to have the ability to adapt his environment to wherever he was in his mental world. New books he'd read, new objects he's collected, new things, all of that, new experiences. So in that sense, this is both a pedagogical opportunity and for me a very rich, aesthetic, immersive opportunity. Mm, absolutely. Well, so the the first gallery, for those who have not yet come to visit the exhibition, is primarily the photography from our collection. And then, of course, we have this gorgeous standing Buddha in the mm. exhibition as well in the first room and a few other items from his collection. But you mentioned the immersive experience part, and that's really, I think, uh, an exceptional aspect of this particular project. Agreed. Uh, and uh, and that's where working with an architect has mm. come in particularly handy. So, um, Clinton, talk us through the thinking, because it was really your genius that, that brought us our recreated living room. So yeah. tell me about why, why the living room? What was the opportunity there for you? Yeah, well, and to be clear, uh, the show could be complete with these photographs. It's exceptional. Um, The intimacy of the photographs uh, allow you to move into the granularity of his life. And I'm fully satiated with the the first, um, uh, with the first section of this show. But I do uh, feel that uh, often uh, we are trying to project ourselves into environments. And uh, there is something that was available with uh, presenting the work in this gallery that uh, brought an exceptional uh, possibility that the dimensional scale of the second chamber of the gallery is fundamentally the dimension of his living room of this 640 square foot um, uh, garage conversion. So I felt it was an incredibly important opportunity to really emphasize that uh, there's this incredible uh, play between uh, the scale and and tightness of this building in an urban uh, environment, and the vastness that he was able to create, not only with uh, the short view, long view, uh, the, the positioning of a building, uh, and his living room in the building to look out of a window onto uh, a primarily a landscape proposition, mm-hmm. but going through the content of the, the work that we were going to show, which were the, the collections, the pieces of, uh, that were on his shelves when uh, he lived in the home, uh, is simultaneously this incredible culling of information, but in what he kept around him in a very small uh, vessel, mm-hmm. it's 
it's an entire universe of information. Mm. It's my hope is that this show will really reinforce that um, that this was a critical leap point, a laboratory for his greater thinking, and mm. you see it uh, you see it played out in the intimacy of a living room recreated. I'm so thrilled that we were able to create a scenario where we could take these valuable objects, get them on the shelves, but actually allow for individuals to sit in the living room on a replication of a uh, you know, a played back uh, set of cues of what the scale of that living room yeah. was. Really excited about that because there's, you know, you're, there's we're stepping into layers of intimacy here. And my hope is that people will understand that while he was incredible in his ability to extract information and deploy it in his greater works, that he did all of this in an incredibly modest environment that um, perhaps separates him as a Canadian master architect from um, the larger international scene. Mm -hmm. he, he sought a type of uh, modesty that I mm. think helped ground him in his work and connect him to one of his greatest ambitions, which is to uh, have a, an incredibly important relationship of building to landscape. Absolutely. So I, we want to talk about the objects that we have in the exhibition in a minute, but for the purposes of contextualization for our audience, I think it's important to say that we here at the Art Museum are in a converted house. So mm. we're uh, in the house that was designed and built by a woman named Gertrude Lawson, who was a teacher at a local school uh, and uh, who uh, lived in this house from 1939. Uh, to 1989. Mm. Uh, so yes, we have this amazing domestic interior that we've we've sort of adapted to serve our purposes, but which is ultimately a historical house yes. in our community. Uh, and then we have the context of the Arthur Erickson House, which, uh, as we mentioned before, is is in Point Grey in Vancouver. It is a very small space. Mm. It is essentially, as you've said, a, a converted garage. You've also called it Vancouver's first laneway house. I think it is. Case, I think it is. I, yes. I love as a description. Yes. Yeah. Um, but it's 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 not just the house that's important in this particular case. It's Arthur's garden, which yes. is extremely important, and which uh, is significantly larger than the house itself. And one of the the other great. Uh, features of our exhibition is the model of the house on the site, yes. so one gets a full sense of the scale uh, of the house and the garden. And you can see how large the garden is compared to the house. Um, the garden essentially was a was a design of Arthur's, from mm. what I understand. Yes. Do you want to speak a little bit more, mm -hmm. Michael, perhaps about the garden and, and the beauty of it? So he acquired the property for $11,000 with these two small, one thing, one was a garage and one was a garden shed, uh, and set about immediately to reconfiguring what was the formal lawn of the place into a, a sort of imagined but historically precedent-based Japanese garden. Mm. A viewing platform, a berm, the plantings, the pond, uh, and so, in that sense, and then the building of the fence, the other piece was mm -hmm. critical in the building of the fence and then closing his garden off as part of the refuge that which the house is an extension. Uh, the garden's incredibly important because it is masterful in the way that it uses space and plant material to create something distinctive and yet resonant with the specific coast world. I'm always struck, if I can shift from the garden to the house, that if we look at a picture taken by Pullman that's in polychrome color showing Arthur sitting on his sofa in his living room, color punches. Mm. The garden has rotos which are colorful, but for the most part it's a very muted palette. Mm. Mm. Temperate west coast rainforest with bamboo and other things. And then inside the house for the period that's being recreated in the exhibition, it's about color. Mm. Mm. This sort of Mughal sensibility of bright silks and luxurious materials such as travertine. And I think it was that counterpart between the interior world and the natural landscapes outside, which of course were highly cultivated, both inside and outside are highly cultivated, but in language with each other. Mm, absolutely. And and the garden, I mean, it's, it's sort of funny preparing a project like this because I, I never had the opportunity to meet Arthur, uh, but I have met many people who knew him fairly well. And 
whenever I speak about the house and I'm coming at it from the angle of our perspective, mm -hmm. looking at it as, as a refuge, as a, as a sort of context for who he was as a person, as a collector, and looking at his influences, everybody always says, yes, but the parties, the parties were fantastic. Yes. So it, it is, yes, the house was a refuge. Yes, the garden was, was meant to be a place, I think, for quiet contemplation yes. and inspiration. But on the flip side, he was also an entertainer. You bet he was. And yes. I've heard fantastic tales of people going to gala benefits in the garden. and. Uh, I think there was one particular party where uh, ballet was performed, and then a family of raccoons traveled up the the yes. tree in the background. So um, it almost has become a little legendary as a location, uh, which is another aspect of Arthur's legacy, I think. That's a very important point you make. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, m Mr. Erickson was a, a social person. He valued conversations, he loved students, he esteemed his colleagues. And yes, that that garden where you could you can wander, you can go from hard material pavers into these little enclaves or glens or coves of flowers and plants. And you could get a glass of wine and you could listen to music. And those of us who had the great pleasure and privilege of being in that garden with other people, you could see that Mr. Erickson was always so pleased to share it with people. Mm. People would go into the house, but the house was a very different experience, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know. And uh, if anyone has ever, if you go to the house, one is struck by the scale. It, it's small, but it feels inviting and large. But the most curious part for me was his study and where he slept. He mm -hmm. had this tiny little sleeping loft tucked in the most far corner of the complex, uh, accessible only by a very small ladder. Mm. And if you would ask him about that, he said, I wasn't going to ever give up a lot of space to sleeping. <laughs> Wise man. <laughs> I wanted a place for reading and books, mm. for looking out. The house is a platform to look out, and it's a place to be in. So uh, let's just talk a little bit about about the collection, the, the, the objects that he surrounded himself with. Mm. As you've pointed out already, it's a really carefully a considered combination of, mm -hmm. of books and, and objets d'art and, and the things that he loved and collected in his travels. Uh, so we were very fortunate to be able to work with a number of different people to put this mm -hmm. project together. Uh, and this is probably an appropriate place to, to thank all of our many contributors. Mm -hmm. We worked with a number of, of colleagues who helped us to create the model and the, the um, the living room, um, but we also uh, were able to work with Arthur's family members yes. um, to borrow pieces that we felt were emblematic of the pieces, some of which were the pieces in the photographs mm -hmm. and some of which were mm -hmm. were emblematic of the pieces in the photographs. So um, Clinton, you and I made those selections together. Is there one object for you which is absolutely essential and something that, that for you makes the experience of getting to know Arthur through this context. Mm. Well, um, initially, the, sto the, sh the show started with an understanding and perhaps a fear of whether we could secure authenticity for the show. Mm. So there were early conversations about uh, creating a series of approximations, something that could bring you into kind of a sense that might be uh, similar to uh, what one might experience. Um, but, you know, as you put it, the stars aligned on so many different levels. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had always felt that if we had the photographs as a, as a leap point, it would be wonderful if we could then see uh, those pieces represented in the show in the second uh, chamber. And uh, so, of course, Without uh, the Gordon Smith from Lois Milson, um, I don't think the show would have uh, the, um, you know, have the sense of of uh, immediacy of being in the environment as we have. You know, that we are uh, we will be greeted by uh, the photograph of the piece and immediately, in similar fashion to the way in which someone experiences Arthur's house and garden, we're able, able to move from the short view into the Versailles long view mm -hmm. and see the painting uh, uh, drawing you quickly into the second chamber. So um, 
Um, and it's incredibly important that that piece is on the wall for a number of reasons, including having a representation of Lois in the show. Mm -hmm. So that's incredibly important. But I would be lying to you if I didn't say that um, I didn't equally feel that the uh, the bundle of Penguin uh, Masters, uh, the series of, of uh, literature pieces that um, are barely holding together because mm -hmm. Arthur uh, would have taken them who knows where and read them. Um, I feel that Arthur's in the room mm -hmm. because of the where uh, mm -hmm. that we were able to uh, bring. So I don't know how it happened, but the family has been incredibly gracious. Mm -hmm. um, so thrilled to be able to, to, to uh, give us these pieces for the show so that we didn't have to uh, reach an approximation. Mm. But um, so I'm, I'm thrilled that it all came together. And we, we, yes, we have many of the books that are on the shelf in the pull and photographs. Uh, we really worked to cull uh, all of the pieces that were given to us by the family to ensure that it was of that period. So I think in totality, there's an authenticity that I'm really proud of in this show. Mm. But in particular, thank you, Lois. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yes. The, the Smith, the Gordon Smith painting that hung above his fireplace for so many years is being able to see it in person is is I agree completely yes. beautiful. Um, Michael, I'd love to have you speak a little bit more about some of the objects that we've borrowed and how they fit into Arthur's sort of legacy. His professional life was as much about imagining spaces being inhabited by people, but also having aesthetic aspects beyond the architecture, the furnishings, textiles for drapes, etc. That professional engagement with the experience of a room, haptic as well as visual, was fully informed by his life in this house. I mean, he would talk about life as a child, and he constantly rearranged his mother's furniture, and he, paint, <laughs> he painted his brother and his bedroom mm. with aquatic scenes, if I remember correctly. <laughs> so the idea that he would create this remarkably textured and rich world in which the objects were gathered from auction houses, antique stores, and travels. Mm. Add to that, it, as I mentioned, it constantly evolved. You could go to Arthur's house regularly, and things would be moved, and he would say, I've shifted this over here, or I've done this, or look at what I found, and et cetera, et cetera. And if we were to line up the photographs across time, and it's possible with this, you can see that, oh, this has this image, but the next sequence of images, several years later, furniture's gone, mm -hmm. re different use of a space. He, he was very drawn to and knowledgeable of uh, what I'll call broadly Asian material culture, mm -hmm. specifically interested in uh, religious and devotional objects coming out of South Asia, Cambodia, Cambodia, Laos, and other places, India, and then Japan. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, he had collections uh, that have been dispersed. Uh, and uh, if we if we look carefully at the images that we have of the moment, there's a wide array. But it's there's a honed mm -hmm. approach. Mm -hmm. These are things that he loved, and he appreciated them. It wasn't having objects just for the sake of having objects. No. These were these were deeply meaningful to him. If I can make a comment, I'm reminded of a book that I think if anyone is inclined to think about their own lives in material possessions, it's by an art historian named Mario Praz, mm. and it's called The House of Life. And Praz narrates his life. It's an autobiography by walking people through his Rome apartment. Oh, fantastic. And he'll talk about things. And uh, I've known Praz's text for a long time. Arthur knew Praz's text. And he would never say that I was modeling my life on it. But he could walk around a room and tell his life story based on the mm. objects mm. on shelves. And so when you see a photograph by Pullen, what we're really looking at is Arthur as a type of open book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He's telling us about his life through the world that he's recreated, that he, in which he lived which reified who he was as a person in the world. Absolutely. I, the, the objects are each little treasures. They represent, as you say, journeys. I can't help but make a little plug for a, an excellent West Vancouver connection, which is that 
uh, when Arthur went to Japan for the first time, Bert Binning gave him a list of living masters to mm. visit, artisans to go and visit. Oh, wow. Uh, and that, I think, maybe started him off, at least on his, on his love and interest in Japanese objects. It's a very nice objects. piece. Mm. It's, it is, nice it's, a good, it's a good West Vancouver plug. Mm. <laughs> um, so let's talk a little bit about um, the, the sort of legacy of Arthur. Mm. Why, why are we still interested as a general public in in the figure of Arthur Erickson? Mm. What is it about him that appeals not just to us from a sort of academic perspective, uh, from an architectural perspective, mm. but, but why, the, why the interest of him so within a general audience? Let me take the easier audience? part of that question, <laughs> please. Um, I want to, uh, because of you know, how he framed how I've come to the work, and I'm, I'm working diligently to try and answer your question for the next generation of makers. Mm -hmm. And I, and that's what intrigues me. And of course, that's how I have to be positioned with uh, with this, because I wasn't as fortunate uh, to be part of those Bakian parties as, uh, as Michael was. Um, but I'm excited that this show can begin to remind us that uh, the work doesn't fall out of our shirt sleeves, mm. that, that it comes out of a series of leap points. So the mm. intimacy of this show, I can only imagine these were a series of catalytic cues to allow for rich conversation and thought and construct to, uh, to manifest from. And so Arthur taught us about a road that could be walked and how to see uh, when we're walking down that road, mm. uh, how we can pull and gather and not be literal in, in how we extract. Like we are living in a period of time which is incredibly important because if we look at, if we look at the rich lesson across all cultures, we can bring forward a new proposition that is strongly rooted in a lineage of, uh, of great thought and bring us away from a notion that uh, of self-creation, and I think that's Arthur's greatest lesson mm -hmm. to future generations of makers: that they can trust their intuition, mm. uh, they can look, see, and pull from the work. You know, there was uh, uh, in his book collection were uh, incredibly important bridge texts that one would see with Frank Lloyd Wright. You know, in thinking about uh, his connection with Girjif and Ospensky, uh, ways of seeing um, that that was very close in, in, in Frank Lloyd Wright's uh, uh, development of Tellius and West and the curriculum. But I think Arthur saw it completely different in why he looked at it. He was uh, reminded in those texts, I can only assume, that, uh, that we live in the basement of our abilities <laughs> and, we need to, and we need to stop and observe and understand uh, how that works as a driver before we move forward to make mark on paper. Mm -hmm. So I hope that uh, uh, that when people ask who and why, uh, I'm able to begin to remind people that he hoped that we would continue to uh, to be as inquisitive and be and push the work in uh, in a way that was not st stylistically mandated. Mm. I I mean I think it's still fair to to say even now that that it, we can recognize him as a visionary in design. Yes. Uh, I I think. You know, we can point to projects like Robson Square and the concept of, of turning a high rise on its side. Yes. I mean, th that was that was incredible vision mm. uh, and and still very relevant today. Yes. Certainly shaping not just our <coughs> our local landscape here, but shaping other landscapes Absolutely. beyond Vancouver as well. Michael, do you want to jump in as well? With a <laughs> well, I'm, I'm response to still that? processing Clinton's very smart commentaries about mm. Mr. Erickson and the power that his practice and his life can provide, can serve for young people in upcoming generations. Uh, so I would say why, why is the enduring fascination of Arthur Erickson? I think that was your question. Mm. I mean, I think, you know, this was a genius who from an early, early age was identified by people as being a remarkable person. Lots of smart people in the world, no doubt. Mm. But I think this was a preternaturally remarkable person. Mm. You know, he had his first painting show at 15 or 16 at the Vancouver Art Gallery. Mm. Lauren Harris was a mentor and promoted him. Mm. He became immersed in philosophy. 
he learned to speak Japanese. Mm. He had this remarkable design sense. I mean, all of these things. Uh, and he was from Vancouver, British Columbia. And I mm. think within Canada, even though there are many smart people and people who do remarkable work on, on an international scale, there is always pride and awe at the genius who leaves the local place mm. and goes out. Mm. The thing about Mr. Erickson, he never left. He went away, but he was always here. He never gave up his house and garden. He always came back to it. So he lived in Los Angeles, lived in New York, traveled the world. But this was, this was his place, and it was inspiring to him. He was inspired by the natural world. He was inspired by the integrity and dignity of indigenous cultures in this place. He was of a generation, and I, I will make this quick, that was remarkable. Mm -hmm. if, if there's, and your museum has done superb exhibitions around the cultural ferment of that moment, but that post-war period, with Binning's house being a little bit before the first flat-roofed house in Western Canada, the people who came here, the, the Smiths who were here, the Shadbolts who were here, the Binnings who were here, this little Vancouver world, a little city on the mountainside of a northern North American country produced an astonishing generation of creative types mm. of which Arthur Erickson was an important presence. But he would always say that he was empowered and, and made strong by his friendships and by the collaborations and by this sort of culture of inspiration and collaboration and investigation and curiosity. Mm. Absolutely. I think that uh, he, he was of an incredibly important generation mm. of, of thinkers and creatives here uh, in Vancouver, many of whom, <laughs> of course, have connections to West Vancouver, <laughs> which is interesting. Yes. Uh, but um, but there is there was something, I think, uh, truly remarkable, not just about him, but about the people at Jeff Massey, for example, Absolutely. his, his partner. primary business partner. Uh, and, and there was an optimism, a post-Second World War optimism, I think, for mm. that generation. Many, many people from here, but many people who came here oh, this well. was This was the destination, a mm. type of coastal utopia or mm. aspirational place where things were possible away from the Eastern establishment and the strictures of conformity and all. And Mr. Erickson, you know, his family's father was a war vet, lost both his legs. Mm -hmm. So he grew up very sensitive to the diversity of human experience. Mm. Um, I'm always reminded, he used to tell a story that, you know, his initials were A-C-E, Arthur Charles Erickson, and his mother wanted him to be known as Ace. <laughs> Was he ever known as Ace? I don't know that he was, <laughs> but he would tell that story that his initials spelled out Ace. And you think, Ellie, well, that was prescience on the part of his mother? Mm -hmm. uh, or just that she liked the name I think Martha, every, Charles? I every think mother, every mother wants their child to be Ace. And every mother has an Ace of a child, Absol yeah. absolutely. So let's talk a little bit about, uh, about the fact that he held on to the house for yes. so long. Because he lived there um, for a, a, a number of decades. And as you yeah. say, he kept going back to the house. It's not the house, he's quoted multiple times as, as saying in, in various books that it's not the house that people expected him to have. Right. Uh, I think that when one thinks of Arthur Erickson, one thinks about the large public projects, mm. the New Museum of Anthropology, right. uh, Simon Fraser University that he did with Jeff Massey. Um, we think about these these mammoth structures or these incredibly refined residential projects mm -hmm. yes. by the ocean with yes. these incredible views yes. that uh, are are elegant and 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 quite large most mm -hmm. of them mm -hmm. uh, and and this house that he lived in for so long is not that yes. and it's a little bit of a surprise and I think one of the surprises that one that our visitors will will. Mm -hmm come to um, in, in exploring the project. So um, I'd like to speak a little bit more about the house and garden. Mm -hmm. Now you're both, you're board members of an organization whose mandate it is to, to work on the house. So, so tell me a little bit about that mm -hmm. and um, what that entails. Well, um, the f first thing I'll say in, in regards to your comment, um, I do feel that uh, that the site is small. It's 233 lots brought together. And uh, one would assume that, um, that that stature would make it antithetical to the large-scale works. But 
Uh, I do feel that that property and the way in which he's utilized a number of devices that we've alluded to, uh, right down to the way in which the fence hikes up away from the ground plane to allow the columns of bamboo to be seen up under to give an ambiguity as to where the grove ends, uh, the mound uh, depriving a complete long view so that you don't know what occurs behind it, mm -hmm. um, makes that site as vast as Robson Square. Mm -hmm. So I feel that there are... There's monumental. A, yeah, it is monumental. <laughs> Micro-monumentality. And uh, there are a lot, you know, as we've talked to, there are a lot of secrets on that site um, um, around the social events, but I think the site is by its very nature secretive. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a fascinating piece. Uh, so, uh, so I do feel that it is, um, it is a microcosm of the, of the larger scale work. I don't feel it has, uh, is completely divorced from, uh, from the sentiments of his public uh, work. And I do think that in, in, as in the lead up to this event, we've had some interesting conversations with people and um, we sometimes are asking the reporters, um, are you surprised that he lived this way? Mm -hmm. And so far, we've getting, we're getting responses that we didn't even think, which is, no, I can kind of see it, because you know, I, I think that uh, the way in which he created the relationship of house to garden proportionately, and the way in which he controlled the, uh, the way this vessel looks out to that view is, um, is exactly what someone who had full authority over his personal environments would, might do. Uh, with it, with that type of vision, so I'm, I'm, um, yeah, the, the chips, the dings, um, the uh, the honesty of uh, of that house as a working vessel um, may be uh, slightly surprising to some, but I think that the proposition is not, which is why I feel that uh, as we move forward to begin to um, uh, move perhaps into what would be the second phase of the education program uh, of uh, making people aware of Arthur's house and garden. I think the foundation has done incredible work uh, working through the why. Why is this man important? I think we are now at this rich moment where we're able to bring people into the house to look back out, which has not been available uh, to the foundation and our tours to this point. So as we move forward to, to uh, stabilize the patient, take care of this old building to make sure it doesn't fall to pieces and become organic, uh, it's of fundamental importance that we, that we maintain this patina and, uh, and protect the greatest thing about the site, which is the landscape component. Right. Right. So much of the effort uh, that, uh, that we will be looking to moving forward uh, in the protection of this house and garden is to uh, to prevent any type of undermining of the quality of that experience in this in this humble proposition. Mm. Yeah. Michael, did you want to add anything? Uh, again, I'm listening to my <laughs> colleagues' comments. <laughs> you know, Mr. Erickson would say that he was immediately drawn to the property because of the buildings being at the end of it mm. and that possibility, which he already sort of imagined. He also said that the house the buildings, not distinguished architecture, and could be modified and adapted. He would say that the houses he designed for clients were Gesamtkunst works. Mm. Mm. No, not furnished, but they were not to be tampered with, mm. even though he, know, he knew in the course of his career that there would be additions, paint would be changed, things would be modified. But he always felt that that, if not exactly a betrayal, it, it was unfortunate because the vision of the maker, he, the architect, was being changed. But private property being what it was. But for this house, he said it was always a type of blank canvas. He could do whatever he wanted. Mm -hmm. And he did it many over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. Things would be changed and would be, a, would be commentaries, tangible commentaries on where he was in his thinking, where the world was in terms of stylistic shifts, material preferences, all of these things. And so the house really becomes a type of lesson plan, an organic lesson plan across mm -hmm. his life, which I think is amazing. To Clinton's point, you know, the, the foundation, uh, it, it, is tasked with stewarding Mr. Erickson's legacy. Mm -hmm. This happens to be a tangible piece of it. His houses and his public commissions are the property of governments and individuals. 
we can comment on things as a foundation and we could perhaps advise when asked, but ultimately all we can really do is remind, remind people that this genius made astonishing buildings and contributed in important ways to the legacy of 20th, 20th century architecture in North America and the world. The houses of viewing platform, uh, one of the first trips I took to Japan before I went, Arthur was very clear about a list of things that had to be done. <laughs> Very clear. And passed down from the Bert. Uh, well, no absolutely. <laughs> and, and and he said that the house, his house, was inspired by Katsura Villa mm -hmm. and the hills that surround Kyoto, and that you have to stand in certain places at certain times of day to capture the way the sun will move across the sky, shadows will be cast on the land, and you will experience that from a platform. For him, he could do it from inside his house, mm -hmm. or he could be outside. And I think some of Pullman's, Pullman's photographs with the lounge chair and the little table suggest that this man thrived in and was thrilled by the environment he created as his refuge. Mm. Yes. It, and it, it truly was that. Uh, this has been a delight to speak with both of you about this project. Thank you for your contributions. and. Uh, we, as I say, owe our thanks to many other individuals, and, and those people are acknowledged on our website, but a special thank you to them as well for making this possible. We're delighted here at the Art Museum to have partnered with the Foundation for this project. Uh, and uh, we would also like to uh, mention that this exhibition is one of two exhibitions that is a part of our West Coast Modern Week programming. Uh, something that you both have participated in, mm -hmm. in in various capacities in previous years. Uh, would you like to say a little bit more about the importance of the education piece around West Coast Modern Week and this type of programming? If, if I may, mm -hmm. uh, I think you know the West West Vancouver and Vancouver writ large, and this part of settler colonial British Columbia is is so remarkably beautiful, and I have been long worried that the speculative real estate market here has seen the demise of very important cultural objects. And that either raises a question about the rights of private property, about which I've spoken, or the weakness of heritage legislation to say, no, you cannot tear that down. And we could go through the list. The fact that Arthur Erickson's house stands is important. The fact that your institution supports Modern Week in this place to bring people to an awareness enhanced awareness, whatever it might be, advocacy, radical radical campaigning for the preservation of a built environment. Because if we think about an architectural critic named Kenneth Frampton and the idea of critical regionalism, what was going on here with the Binnings and the Shadbolts and the Bobaks and Mr. Erickson and others, Ron Tom, was of international importance. Mm. And the houses that were designed because of, in response to the environment to make lives for people matter. And I would like to think that we need to do everything we can to make sure that that's preserved. Mindful that we are in indigenous lands and we have to be respectful of all cultures, but this was a significant moment in the culture of our nation. Well, I mean, the education around West Coast modernism for us is extremely important as yes. an institution. Uh, so thank you for your work in that direction. You're most welcome. Clinton, did you have anything else to add before uh, it's we wrap Not up? much after that, but, um, you know, but it's, it's clear that uh, we, as Canadians are always in a state of crisis trying to figure out when we start to become a, a, a critical voice in, in architecture and design. And that only begins with um, a protection of those critical growth rings and the development of, uh, of our own personal dialect in, in, in design and regionalism. Uh, so uh, I know that there is a lot of, uh, a lot of focus now on how to densify our environments and and deal with some really important critical things that are driving our 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 cultural voices out of this province and out of this place and that is uh, deeply concerning. Uh, I am thrilled that we are celebrating this house as opposed to one of uh, the larger West Coast offerings. Not that they are not masterpieces and we could spend a lifetime understanding them. But this reminds us that, um, that while we work to manically uh, figure out what do we need to live, uh, we, we can't forget that the best architecture of the Cascadia region is uh, taking a lead from uh, the landscape inputs that uh, are informing it. And Arthur 
explained to us that a master could live in 640 square feet, but he also reminded us that we uh, that we don't need to necessarily move to the absolute limits of what regulations and bylaws allow us to do, that we could actually take control and have authority over those decisions to make something that's far more dignified and can give us a place where of reprieve where we can uh, gather that critical energy necessary to continue the good fight. Excellent. Well, thank you both very much thank for you. everything that you've been able to speak to this evening. We'd like to invite you to come by the West Vancouver Art Museum sometime soon. We're open Tuesday to Saturday from 11 till 5. And our exhibition, a Refuge, Arthur Erickson, runs until July 20th. We look forward to seeing you here soon. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.